feverishly at work, Lord, trying to come up with solutions on behalf of our nation, Lord, to uh, stymie this growth of this virus and the spread of it. Pray for all those that are working with him as well, Lord. I pray for our nation, dear God, that you would bring us to the place of repentance, dear Father. I pray, dear God, that we call out to you in prayer and ask your forgiveness of the sins of our nation, Father. And I pray, dear God, if it be your will by your wonderful grace, dear God, that you'd bring things to an end with the spread of this virus, Lord, that no more lives will be claimed. Lord, I pray that you take this time, this opportunity to share together. I pray that it be a blessing to our needy souls, I pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you so much, Dylan and Lisa. We appreciate the special numbers that you shared with us. This is the first time for us as a church family. I'm preaching almost empty pews, but I'm going to preach my heart out nonetheless and share with you some things that God has laid upon my heart. I want you to know that I love my church family. Thankful for you all. Certainly I'm going to miss you, but look forward to the day when we'll be able to make our way back. We're hoping that it'll be by the first Sunday in, in uh, April. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, we're trusting the Lord to keep us together and to keep us praying one for another. Keep us looking always unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Before we look into the Word of God together and share, I'd like to once again put the in prayer. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we need not fear, Father, because we know that you are with us. You have promised to be with us unto the ends of the earth. We're so thankful, dear Lord, that we can know with certainty in our heart, dear God, that come what may, whatever you would have to accomplish, Lord, and what's going through our country, and yea, what's going on worldwide, that, Father, we know to whom we belong, we know, Father, if we'd be touched by this affliction, Father, we know, Father, even if you'd take us home to be with you, Lord, it would be in your presence for the rest of eternity. So I'm grateful, Lord, that we have that blessed hope. I'm thankful, Father, that we can share together that today. I pray, dear God, that our hearts would be uplifted by the comparisons that we make, Lord, and I pray that Jesus Christ might be magnified. Of course, in his name I ask and pray. Amen. You can barely turn on a television without hearing some, in one form or another through the news media or whatever concerning the plague of the coronavirus. We're inundated with it throughout our country right now. It's come home to us here across the shores of the, and the oceans to make its way to our nation. We need to pray, as I already said before, we need to pray for our president, vice president, for those that are heading up the the uh, group to combat this, yet we need to know that at large we need to remember things before the Lord Jesus Christ and ask for his enabling to keep us safe, to keep us protected. There's tremendous concern today concerning the coronavirus. It was renamed by the World Health Organization as COVID-19. It was given that acronym, COVID-19. For a long time I scratched my head and wondered, what in the world is COVID-19? Why do they keep a coronavirus disease? And then I looked it up a little bit and I thought, oh, well that kind of makes sense. They take it actually from the, th the three words. They take some of the letters from the three words. They take the co from corona, the first two letters, C-O. They take the, the two letters from virus, the V-I, and they take the D from disease where you get COVID. And then the 19 represents the year in which it started, which was 2019. It didn't start necessarily in our country at that time, but it did start over in China. That seems to be the birthing place of this horrendous virus that has touched our country. To date, over 290,000 worldwide have been infected with this disease, with almost 12,000 12, succumbing to the virus already. In the United States of America, as of March 21st, which would be Saturday, there have been 22,738 cases with 288 deaths, 171 recoveries, making it that there is remaining 22,279 cases yet, people infected by it. It's a wild and it's a wide spreading disease. President, President Trump says we are fighting a, a, another worldwide war against an invisible enemy. We cannot see it, but we see the effects of it. We must be praying for one another. We must be praying for our president, for our vice president and their helpers, and battling this variety, variety excuse me, virus on all levels. We are living in unprecedented times. Never before have we had such an upsurge and, and fast pace a virus moving through our, our nation as this uh, virus is doing today. The world has never experienced such a pandemic, such a pandemic as this before. So highly contagious and three times more deadly than the common flu or the flu of 2020. So think of that. 
as far as its seriousness, it's three times worse, three times more cont contagious. We must, we must, in our taking precautions today in our own society, in our own nation, in hospitals, places of employment, stores, churches, care homes, any place where people ascend, assemble, we are affected by it, just like we are here in our own church. It's a deadly disease, affects all ages. At first they said it was mainly for the seniors that need to take the precautions. Now they're saying that the millennials also affected by it and young people at large are affected by it. Fear and hysteria are emptying our grocery shelves of toiletries, toilet paper, tissue, hand sanitizers, antibacterial soaps, germ killers, Lysol, Clorox wipes, etc. Health caregivers are wearing protective gear. We're told uh, that we should not even go to the hospital unless we show at large the signs of this virus. Great undertaking is taking place today to find a cure or remedy for this, and we're hoping that that will happen soon. We have been duly warned of what the end of effect can be for those who neglect to take these precautions, and that end result would be death. At the first, there was a lot of mixed concerns, but as more cases are rising, the concerns and precautions are escalating even more. Well, as I thought about this disease, I thought about how feverishly people are concerned about their own physical well-being. But we live in a day when people go on, leave on, on heat at the word of God, or even a concern for their own spiritual well-being, which, which in consequence is a greater concern than, than this pandemic. So what I'd like to do is make some spiritual comparisons, if you will, please, concerning the spiritual disease of sin. At large, there is seems to be a disconcern in our country and a total ignorance of the impact that sin has made upon all of mankind. In Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37, it says, For what shall a profit of man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? All have already been completely contaminated by, by sin. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. So this, this uh, sin has impacted the lives of every one of us. There's not a one of us that has been exempted by it. Uh, there is none righteous, no, not one. This, this disease, and I, I don't want to call it that, I shouldn't call it that, disease. This impediment of sin, this wickedness of sin is highly contagious. All have been affected, and all have been affected, not by exposure to other sinners, but at the very moment of conception. The Bible says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, in Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2, verse 3, and there he states in part that we were by nature the children of, of wrath, by nature, our very essence, our very being. From the time of conception, we were children of wrath. We have been spiritually and completely contaminated by sin. Sin has impacted every part of our very essence, not only physically, but intellectually, socially, every part of our makeup, our mind, our will, our compassions, our, our senses, sensibilities, every aspect of our life has been impacted by the presence of sin in our life. In, in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, we read, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we ought to fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The effect of the sin is worse than the effect of the coronavirus. Not only does the effect of sin bring physical death, and the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all will die, but worse than that it brings re results in spiritual death, if a person never, by the grace of God, receives Jesus Christ into the heart to be their personal Savior. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, we read, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we're, we have imputed to us, laid to our account, 
the sin and guilt of Adam, the first man created, who sinned willfully in the garden against God, and we are sinners by our own actions. And so it's imperative that we recognize that we face the not only the, the, the plight of sin in our life, but the degree in which sin can separate us from the love of God. So it's important for us to talk about that this morning. We must be warned. People must be warned. There's all kinds of warnings going out today concerning the coronavirus. As I said, you cannot help but turn on the TV and hear something somewhere about this dreaded disease. People are being warned and duly warned. We're told that the precautions that we ought to take. We ought to keep six feet between us and another person. Whether if we're in, in group circles of no more than ten, that, that we should congregate together in any groups more than ten. That's why we have uh, suspended for temporarily the services of our church. And I think that was the right action on our part to do so. But people need to be warned about the spiritual plight of their sin as well. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 14 it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It's incumbent upon every child of God as God provides for us the opportunities. And he will, and he does provide those for us. Especially, people are talking about this virus. What an op he opportunity to share with them and ask them about their concern for their own soul. What is the state of their spiritual well-being? And so, people need to hear from us. We need to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you with your neighbors and your friends to not be shy, don't be bashful, don't be backward. Most of all, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But share it with these people. We don't need to be bolts in the china closet, but we need to share with them the grace of God and the wonderful saving grace of God. And how that God sent His Son into the world to save sinners. And how they can come to have full, full total forgiveness of all their sins. They can be cured of this uh, perilous disease of sinfulness. They can avert the, condemnation, the just condemnation of God. Perhaps some of the most well-renowned verses in the scriptures in the New Testament are found in John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, where it says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Please, folks, take the opportunity. That neighbor of yours, may, you may be the only person that will ever share the gospel with them. You hate to see them slip out into eternity, never to hurt. Or worst of all, because of your reluctance, they will spend eternity in hell because you've never shared with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's important for us to share that. All must see their need, and then they must heed their need. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. The devil loves to go unnoticed. Our president said that we are facing an invisible enemy. Folks, in the spiritual realm, we also are facing a spiritual enemy. The devil doesn't have flesh and blood like we, like we do. He's an evil spirit. He's the anoint, he was the anointing of God who fell because of the pride of his life, wanting to be like the Most High. He was cast forth from out of heaven. And he's invisible. But mark it down that he's just as real as can be. Just because we can't see him, we can see the effects that he has upon the lives of people. You look at that trumpet, you can see the control the devil has over his life. You look at that prostitute, you can see the control the devil has over his life. We may think because we live upright lives, because we live good lives, that the devil doesn't have control over us. But the truth is that he's out to blind our understanding to our need to receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 4, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil is out to cause you to be disinterested in your soul's greatest need, which is to receive Christ as your personal Savior. He'll cause you to be bored with things about church. He'll cause you to be disinterested in spending time and reading the Word of God. Anything that He can do to avert you from spending serious moments contemplating your own, the destiny of your own soul, He will do it. He'll fill your time with uh, 
empty things. You'll fill your times with busyness. You'll fill your times with activities. You'll fill your times with people. Anything you can to keep you from thinking about your soul's greatest need. And your soul's greatest need is to come face to face with an understanding of the wickedness of your sin. How your sin caused Jesus Christ to die on the cross as a substitute and a sacrifice for your sin. How he is the only way of salvation. There is no other way of salvation but through him. He is God's way. Jesus even said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So it's imperative, it's important that you take the time to contemplate where will you spend eternity when you die? When you draw your last breath, where are you going to be? The, the options are only twofold, either in heaven or in hell. Hell is a real place. It's not a cuss word. Hell is a real place. It's the place that the Lord has prepared for the devil and his angels. The first two occupants of Gehenna hell is going to be the Antichrist and the false prophet. The third occupant is going to be the devil himself. And according to Revelation chapter 20, whosoever's name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. All who reject Christ as their personal Savior someday will spend forever. Time on ending. Time non-existent. Forever. No second chances. No second opportunities. No, well, if I had another opportunity, I'd do differently. You will not be afforded that opportunity. You will be lost forever. Your soul is in great jeopardy today if you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior. That's why it's imperative today, right now, to, to recognize your sin, be broken over your sin, be uh, repentant over your sin, and ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave him the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In Acts chapter 26, verse 18, Paul says there, he is sharing his testimony, he says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, that is in me, from the power of Satan. Do not underestimate the power of Satan. Do not underestimate what he is able to do. Listen, folks. There are people that go to churches where they never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ clearly presented. There are people that don't go to churches at all. They're completely disinterested, completely removed in their thoughts from spiritual things. It's time, and the only way that they're going to know and hear is, is if we share with them the truth of God's word. The gospel message, the gospel mandate is not just given to missionaries, it's given to every one of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior to share the gospel with our friends. The result of sin is not just physical death, but eternal separation from God. God told them, in the day ye eat thereof, you will surely die. They did, but not physically. Adam lived to be over 100 years old. And then he died. But he died spiritually. He was separated in his spirit from God. He took on uh, total depravement. And through his sin, he was justly condemned because he disobeyed God, because he sinned against God. So it's important to realize that, that the consequence was not, first of all, physical death. It was, first of all, spiritual separation from God. And we are all born in the likeness of Adam. We have all put on the likeness of Adam. We're all born with that, it's the sin of Adam and its accompanying guilt and condemnation is laid to our effect as well. Plus we are sinners by actions as well. It's important for us to realize that unless we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, we'll be eternally separated from God. Death is separation. Those who die from the coronavirus will be separated from their loved ones. But listen, the worst kind of death is not to die from a virus like that, or even cancer or anything like that. The worst kind of death is to die lost in your sin. So I plead with you, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, perhaps you're, you've tuned into our website, you're a friend of our church, or maybe just cruising through the website and found us and you're listening to this message, I would plead for you to listen to the whole message. I would plead to you, with you to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible tells us that when we die without Christ, we die of what is called the second death. And that, that second death uh, uh, is the eternal separation from the love of God and from the presence of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, 
shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have we not cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Boy, that's going to be a terrible thing to hear. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Religion doesn't save us, folks. In fact, religion can be very damnable and very confusing. There are not many ways to God. There are not many alternatives. There is but one way. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. If righteousness come by the deeds of the law, then Christ has died in vain. It is imperative that God send in one who could be accepted, the sacrifice could be accepted by a holy God. Jesus Christ became the propitiation for our sins. He became the satisfaction for our sins by suffering in our place as our substitute and as our sacrifice. Only through him is there the forgiveness of sin. There is no other way of salvation. There is no other way of the forgiveness of our sins but by him. For this spiritual malady, God alone has provided an antidote. And that antidote for, for man's sinful condition and plight is found in none other than Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, we read, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. In the, in the book of Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 23, down through verse 26, we read these words. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sin that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. At the moment we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, our condemnation is forgiven us. It departs from us. We put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God's answer to the just condemnation of man's sin is the justification that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ, where we are declared righteous because we are accepted now in his beloved Son. All of mankind, upon the genuine acknowledgement of their wickedness and their sinful state and sincere repentance of their sin, are forever forgiven. I like that thought. Forever forgiven. We'll never be judged according to our sins because our sins have already been dealt with. And we've been forgiven of our sins. In the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 13, it says, And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. And I'm so thankful to the Lord for the forgiveness of all my sin. Not just a few things. Never again will I stand before the Lord guilty. The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I'm thankful that I'll never have written on, on my name condemned. I'm thankful that, that that has already been laid to, to the side because there was a day that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and the just sentence of my condemnation has been satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ and I am declared in Him as being righteous. Romans chapter 5 verse 18 says, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So then, what lies ahead for those who have rejected Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? We say today that we are living in unprecedented times. We've never gone through situations like this before. Folks, I'm here to tell you there are situations that are going to be worse, more vile, more despicable than what we're experiencing today. This is nothing, literally nothing, compared that awaits those who go through a time known as the time of Jacob's troubles, the seven years of great tribulation which will take place immediately after the rapture of the church. I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus comes to take us home to be with him. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 says, Paul writes, says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are sleeping. Then he details there how someday the Lord is coming and those who have preceded us in death are going to meet us in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. How I look forward to that day. I look forward to the 
metamorphosis, the transformation that 1 Corinthians 15 talks about, will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and forever will be with the Lord. I'm grateful for that. Jesus promised, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What a wonderful promise that is. But that promise is only given to those who have trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Should Jesus come back for the church today, the time known as Great Tribulation will take place. The Bible promises in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 10, to the church of Philadelphia, to whom the Lord Jesus writes, he says that I will keep you from the hour of great tribulation which shall come upon all the earth. And so I'm thankful that we're going to be up with him in heaven. But the time, you know, those seven years of great tribulation are going to be unprecedented times like the world has never, ever seen before. As I said, the church will be raptured, but all of mankind left behind will experience unprecedented times not ever known. Catastrophic, catastrophic events such as total darkness, earthquakes, the moon turned to blood, stars falling to earth, famine, a worldwide ruler who determines who buys or sells, hail and firestorms, third part of the sea turned to blood, third part of mankind killed, third part of the sea creatures destroyed, third part of all sea vessels destroyed, waters made bitter, causing many to die as a result of it, locusts, whose sting would be like the sting of a scorpion, causing men to yearn for death, but do not die. Plagues, death, and on we can go. It's going to be a terrible time. Folks, God is not willing that you should go through that time. Your only remedy is, behold now, is accept the time, behold today, is the day of salvation. This is why men everywhere are called to repent and receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow, dear friend, may be too late. I'd like to close with two passages from the Word of God. I selected three passages, actually. I selected a verse or two verses from each of them. First is Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. It says, In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Then it, Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, the first part of that verse. Listen to these words. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Folks, there is no escape for what awaits the world if you reject Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's why it's imperative that you take a good look at yourself, that you agree with what God says in his word, that you're a sinner, that you're in need of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. There's no works of righteousness which we can do that will ever be acceptable to the Lord. We're not saved because we'll go to church. We're not saved because of church membership. We're not saved because of baptism. We're not saved because we live a good life. The issue is not about man's goodness. The issue is about man's unrighteousness and how we need to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did in sacrifice for our sins and receive him and ask him to come into our heart into our life and receive him as our personal savior. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And then I close with this once again. I've said it many times, but I want to leave you with this thought in mind in 2 Corinthians 6, 2. It says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation, that's what today is. Today is the day of salvation. Today you have the opportunity to repent of your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior based upon his finished work on Calvary his death, burial, and resurrection. And in the day of salvation have I succored thee. The word succor means to draw to his side. I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God has done everything he can possibly do to redeem you, to save you from your sin, to save you from a time of eternal agony in the pit of hell. But you have to do something too. And what you have to do is acknowledge your sin and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's my earnest prayer that you will do that. I'd like to close in prayer at this time, and then Dylan's going to come and play another number for us. Gracious God, take the words that we've shared 
and making this comparison to what's going on in our day. I pray, dear God, that we realize that, Father, we are living in a time, Lord, that's perilous. We're living in a time, Lord, where lives can be snuffed away just like that, just by exposure to a hidden enemy, this virus. But as sure as that is true, or even more so is it true, that there are many today that are perishing who go into eternity without having ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. There's only one way that we can be made right and have a right standing with you. It's the way that you have provided. It's God's way. And it's through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, I would ask and pray that you take the message that we've shared, speak to the heart of that person who has never trusted you as Savior, who's never taken serious, Lord, where they're going to spend eternity. And I pray, dear God, that the Spirit of God, who alone can bring conviction to a heart, would do so. And I pray that today might be the day of that person's salvation. Today be the day that they would repent of their sin and receive Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. And God, in closing, I would ask that you'd be with our people. Thank you for our church. Thank you for our church family. Keep our people protected, I pray, dear God. I pray, dear God, in this time that we're away from one another's presence, that we might value the time that we have when we come together, Lord. That we'd be thankful for the blessed fellowship that we enjoy with one another. That we'd yearn in our hearts for each other and that we'd pray for one another. And help us, Lord, not to put to the side our contacts with people who have needs, people that we need to befriend, people that we just need to let them know that we're thinking about them. Father, may we come through this a better people, a better congregation for the glory of Jesus Christ. Be with our sister churches. I think of the dear folks at Union Baptist and Grace Baptist. I pray, dear God, that you'd be with those pastors and church family, Lord. I know that, Lord, maybe they're doing the same thing that we're doing here with our family. I pray that you'd bless the outreaches that are made, the efforts that are made to keep us together. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.